Hey, don't want to wait so long in between main channel meatball content? Well, check out some links in the description because these thumbnails on screen are other videos you probably missed. How's it going, everybody? Chaotic Meatball here, and welcome back to the channel. Well, off the heels of another trash run in the books with Brilliant Diamond, I figured we'd hop back into the world of ROM hacks with one that I've actually played before, just not on this channel. It's been years since I've touched it, though, and I've heard that there's quite a number of changes and balance updates included, and that's with Pokemon Glazed and the Toonod region. This game features Pokemon up through Gen 5 while also having the fairy typing added on to those who are retroactively made fairy types, as well as the physical special split and a custom region, so it should provide for a pretty fun time. Speaking of the fairy type though, I'm not using that. However, I'm using a type that's weak to it, that being Dark. There's a good selection of Pokemon being available throughout though, like Mightyena, Zoroark, Hydreigon, Umbreon, Sableye, Drapion, Weavile, Absol, Honchkrow, Scrafty, and Houndoom. However, there are two little problems that have come up. First one of which is that Zwilus doesn't evolve into Hydreigon until level 64. And I can assure you that the level cap is not high enough by the time we get to the League to see the final form, and that the game only has one Dusk Stone available before the Elite Four, meaning I'll have to choose between either Honchkrow or Weavile, seeing as the latter requires a Dusk Stone instead of the Razor Claw in this game to evolve. However, there is a little bit of a fix to this. Which leads into my last point before getting into the run itself, and that's that Pokemon Glazed has a day and night cycle. This means Pokemon like Eevee can evolve through their normal means of friendship for the Gen 2 Evos, but this is also used on several other Pokemon, such as the aforementioned Weavile, who can evolve from Sneasel by having high friendship during the night, as well as Duskstone, so we can at least get around that hurdle. Anyway, make sure to check the description for the rules. Also, please do leave this video a like. I would love to hit 2,500 likes for the first Pokemon Glazed run on the channel. Subscribe if you haven't already. And if you have one, follow me over on Twitter. I post a lot of funny hahas. Plus, it's a great resource for getting notified as to when videos come out on both this channel and my TCG channel, rather than the faulty system that YouTube has in place now. Link will be in the description as well as in the iCard in the right hand corner of your screen. Anyway, enough needless gabbing, it's time to take on the Toonod region and see if we can cover it in a little bit of darkness. So for my starter, I get five choices rather than the normal three, with the choices being the normal Sinnoh starters, Shinx, and Riolu. I decided to choose Shinx here since some ROM hacks opt to change this line to an electric dark lineup, and since I don't remember whether or not this is one of the hacks to do so, I take it on the hunch it could be possible, as I already know the other ones won't be. It's not, just so you're aware. Fortunately for me though, my first dark type encounter is not far down the line. After reaching Chaco Town and being given the Pokedex as well as 10 Pokeballs, in the forest pass just to the west houses Poochiana. This is only the first of a few Pokemon that will have the Intimidate ability thanks to our type choice, as Zorua and Zoroark also have this ability due to Illusion not working properly on the GBA. I'm not sure, it could just be that someone didn't want to program it. I also figured I'd begin my EV training on Poochiana immediately, seeing as I've already been given the EXP share so I can divert half of the experience over to my useless Shinx, therefore doubling my available EV pool from the level 2 Pokemon around here. Once Poochiana's halfway through level 7, I figured it's time to have an encounter with this game's evil team already under the name Team Fusion. I'm actually writing this script as I go, so I have no idea what they're trying to do just yet, but there's a bit of transportation of our player character between Toonod and the real world, where Pokemon don't exist as real creatures, and I'm gonna assume they have something to do with trying to fuse those dimensions together, but we'll have to figure that out with later encounters. After getting through the Milkshake Swamp, I'm spit out in the Ocean View Park shortly before Ocean View City itself, where the first gym of the game awaits. Of course, the gym leader isn't quite available just yet, requiring me to take out this scarfed Pikachu that I met at the beginning of the game to get him to go back. But once he's in, I'm just about ready to take on Sparky. Yeah, that's definitely a person's name, not a dog's name. Now this level cap may vary based on the version you're playing and will vary for all gym leaders. And since I'm on version 9.1.0, Sparky's Ace Jolteon is at level 15 
meaning I don't have access to Mighty Yana like the builds that have his Jolteon at level 18 would. But that should be just fine thanks to my access to Mudslap and my full EV training I managed to complete under that level threshold with my newly evolved Luxio, holding the EXP share during all of this time. Before I can get to Sparky though, we've got a trainer right in front of the gym to take on in Shell. She ends up acting as one of the two rivals throughout the game, the first of which I met before I got Poochyana, so we'll see him down the road, but Shell has two Pokemon here. The late Chikorita ends up being the biggest threat among them, as it uses Poison Powder and gets Poochyena poisoned for the first turn, and it also lowers its attack with Growl, but three bites are still enough to put him down, leaving just Pikachu, who thankfully just goes down to a critical hit instead of sticking around long enough for this poison to matter. Alright, now it's Sparky time. He leads off with Shinx as Intimidate activates, but I have both Howl and Mudslap, so assuming I set both of these up, this should be a swift fight. After using 6 mud slaps and getting rid of one of his healing items in the process, I'm able to use Howl 7 times, maxing out my attack and only being hit once due to Shinx just wasting time using charge over and over and over and over and over again. Eventually I'm able to just take out everybody with one bite apiece, taking out Shinx, Flaffy, and Jolteon to KO and win the first patch. Not too bad, especially for one member of the team. Thankfully, we'll have access to a nearly full team before the second badge, so there's nothing much to worry about past this point, other than probably my own stupidity. After heading on the ferry to Serenity Isle, I'm immediately told to head south on the bridge to make it back to the starting town, finally evolving Poochyena into Mightyena and getting Intimidate as my ability rather than Runaway. This will be a major help, especially against the Team Fusion Grunts later on who specialize in the annoying fighting type. But that's not it, since Dorua is available on the Springside Path, with Dano being in the Forlorn Cape over in Professor Willow's Special Garden, bumping our team to three members, and again, Zorua also has Intimidate, so this should be a pretty nice team setup. This is also pretty nice because I now have a physical attacker in Mightyena, a special attacker in Dano, and a mixed attacker in Zerua, which really fills out the offensive capabilities of the team. I really just need to get a hold of Sableye ASAP to give me that fighting type immunity and defensive option, and I'll just be set for the rest of the game, knock on wood. Before I take on the second gym on Serenity Isle though, I've got to take care of Team Fusion over on the Haunted Isle, somehow making it through both a near-death experience with that scarfed Pikachu and Mightyena being brought to 1 HP, as well as a double battle with a Machamp and a Conkelder this early in the game. Thank you, Accuracy, Shenanigans, and Double Intimidate from Mightyena and Zerua. I would have not survived if it weren't for those. I'm able to eek past that pair of grunts to their leader, Michael, which is a very unassuming name, and also has a very unassuming battle, seeing as the only member of his team is Zoroark, so I just do a few setup moves and take it out thanks to Mighty Anna's Poison Fang, getting the poison off. I honestly didn't even pay attention to how many members of his team there were, and just started setting up with Howl during those poison turns to prepare for what lied ahead, but turns out there was nothing to fear. The only thing I had to fear was being able to get to the top of the lighthouse challenge back on Serenity Isle without hitting the level cap. See, the reward for taking down all eight trainers in a row is an Eevee, and we all know what this guy is for, and thankfully by continually having the EXP share sit on Luxio, I'm able to get to the top, retrieving Eevee and evolving it into Umbreon. Before taking on that gym, however, I moved a little bit of out of order, proceeding to Sea Spray Town thanks to the fairy ticket given to me after taking out Team Fusion the last time, running into Shell once again, having evolved her Chikorita and Pikachu since the last time we saw her. I immediately lead off with Poison Fang to get her into Synthesis range so that I could get a free Howl, then try to cycle between them turn after turn. However, he goes for Reflect after Poison Fang not only hits, but also badly poisons Bayleaf, giving me a free turn to not only use Howl, but to use multiple, as enough turns are able to accrue where poison grows to such an amount of damage that a synthesis turn is practically guaranteed near the end, giving me another free Howl at the end of the chain, and then allowing for the KO with Poison Fang leading into Raichu. Now this just falls immediately to a bite after a light fake out lands and eats my Orin Berry I had received from getting Eevee earlier, winning me the battle. Not bad again, I mean, that's pretty good, but once she's down, I'm transported to Newport Ritchie, Florida. 
I feel like the character's trying to get to me. This is way too close to home, you gotta go back into the game. Once everyone's up to level 27, it's time for the ground type gym leader, Terry. Speaking of which, that reminds me I still have yet to get to play King of Fighters 15, despite having bought it on Steam months ago, but I digress. Everybody loves Terry Bogard. Terry leads off with Gligar, and since it's part flying type, I'm unable to hit it with Mighty Anna's Mud Slap. However, since Umbreon's Sand Attack is a status move, it's still able to hit despite being a ground type move, giving me plenty of time to both set up six of those, as well as six curses on the same Mon, allowing for a quick attack sweep to two-shot Gligar and Vibrava, leaving Fanpi to fall to three of them after attempting to use a few bulldozes, but to no avail winning me the fight. Not sure why that's not a Don fan yet, seeing as it was level 27 and it evolves into Don fan at level 25, but hey, I'll take an easy win where I can get it. Two out of eight are taken care of now, though the next one's gonna take a little bit of finagling to get our hands on. After getting back into Sea Spray Town, I have to head towards the power plant next to the dam in order to get a hold of the gym leader, but she's unavailable to battle me for the crest badge until we get this power situation in order. For that, I've got to head through the southern part of the dam into Geminite Village, but right as soon as I make it into the village is when Percy hits us from out of nowhere with a rival fight. This is the other one I spoke about earlier that fought me before I got Poochiana. He uses Quilava as I go with Mightyena, hitting two bites for the near KO as both Flame Wheel and Ember do slightly more than half, though one healing item and flinch later with Bite, and a fifth and final bite takes out the beast, leading to Curlia. While the fairy type is a bit of a curse at the moment due to the dark type not being able to just one shot like you'd expect to into a gen 3 game, the fairy typing is actually helping because I can one shot it with poison fang, meaning I've just got electric to rip through. Due to it being a much lower power level compared to the rest of his team though, it's an easy KO with Dano, flinching with bite and cleaning up the last few points of damage with dragon breath to win the match. Definitely not as hard as I had expected, but then again I'm usually expecting ROM hacks to be more difficult than vanilla Pokemon games. This one is actually keeping it on par with Black 2 White 2's challenge mode, if not a little bit more balanced. Anyway, Geminite Village happens to be where Mount Stratus resides, which happens to contain a bunch of miners. And I love miners! <laughs> no, not those kind of miners, you freaking degenerates. Back in the TNT room ends up housing my next encounter in Sableye, and just in time too. There's a trainer with a rather strong Kong Kelder coming up, and I'd rather not rely on luck like I had to with the double battle earlier on. Once the idiot detonates the dynamite though and causes an avalanche, or is it a rock slide? I wouldn't know because I'm from Florida, I don't know what rocks or snow are. Either way, I'm given both the HM for Strength as well as the one for Rock Smash after making it back to Flow over in the Sea Spray Dam, finally giving me access to the third gym. Zorua ended up evolving into Zoroark on the way though, meaning I've got a super powerful attacker with Night Slash, ready to help take out Flow and her massive party of four water types. She leads off with War Turtle as I go with Umbreon, and this ends up being an interesting exchange. Due to Wartortle having Protect, I eventually got into a rhythm of alternating Sand Attack and Curse, using Moonlight in order to recover any lost HP while using Quick Attack to sweep. Sure, it doesn't one-shot like I'd like it to do, but when it offsets the downsides of Curse in the Speed Department, I don't think I can really complain all that much. Umbreon actually manages to tear through Wartortle, Seedra, and Milotic, all with just Quick Attack as Kingdra comes in last, finally using controlling statuses like Double Confusion from Water Pulse as well as Yawn to put Umbreon to sleep over and over again, ended up draining the remainder of Moonlight's power points, so I've got to take a risk with another party member. Zoroark ends up being the Mon of Choice, where I could just swap in, KO with two Night Slashes after the one Quick Attack from Umbreon landed, giving me the win in quite a weird way. The fact that Umbreon, a notorious tank, is doing halfway decent with Curse Sweep setups absolutely amazes me. Thankfully our next gym battle isn't that far off, with the level cap only increasing from 31 to 34, it makes sense that they'd be close by. Heading back south to Geminite Village and continuing south from there leads me to the Geminite River, and while there is a new encounter here, I'm not grabbing it yet. 
See, Skaroopy is a poison bug type, makes sense that I can't use it, but Drapion is a poison dark type, however it evolves at level 40, meaning I can't use it until after the 6th gym, so I'll be swinging by later to catch it. Once I've done all I can here though, I head my way south into Stormy City, which doesn't really have anything to do except for, you know, fight the gym leader, so we're gonna go ahead and do that real quick. Before heading into the fight, I make sure to go into it leading Dano against his jump bluff. Now that may be sound on a one level, as Dragon resists grass, however this thing has a ton of support moves like Poison Powder, Leech Seed, and Substitute, so I can't just wall up here with a resistance, I have to use the TM for Fire Blast to make sure I'm able to hit extremely fast and relatively hard. Jump Bluff doesn't end up going down in one shot, but three Fire Blasts ends up doing the trick through Leech Seed and Leftovers Recovery, leading to Tangrowth coming out second and taking the last two power points worth of damage after healing with Leech Seed and its Super Potion. A Critical Dragon Claw seals the deal there, with Leafeon coming out third, and here's where the battle became cheesed. See, Leafeon has Dig, so I can go ahead and use Curse on turn 1, and then Sand Attack on turn 2 while supplementing the loss of HP with Moonlights, eventually making it so that Quick Attack would 4 hit KO without a healing item. 7 hit with a healing item, by the way. Very, very much cancerous, if I do say so myself. God. For plus 6 in physical attack, that is absolutely abysmal. Though all that's left is Venusaur, then we should be in the home clear. It was clear from the get-go that this monster's strategy was to status Umbreon as much as possible, hit him with Leech Seed, poison him with Poison Powder, and pound all other Pokemon into the ground with Solar Beam. I did manage to get a few quick attacks in, but not enough for it to matter in the grand scheme of things, only barely managing to eke by the last Pokemon of the fight with Mighty Anna's bite into a flinch, causing the KO with another turn, and the victory. Four badges, zero deaths, I doubt it'll stay like this, it never does, but I almost have confidence that I could do this deathless if given the right luck and best circumstances available. Now that the grass beating has ceased, it's time to head back into Mount Stratus for another encounter with Team Fusion. Now that I have access to Sableye though, they go much easier than they have before, eventually getting me to the end and a fight against Michael's son, Henry. He's got a Huntail and a Gorobis that I'm able to take down pretty handily, though he says he's just not one to be part of Team Fusion and is willing to help stop his dad, so at least the kid's got a conscience. Another universe leap later and I'm ready to head up into North Coast City, passing through Mount Stratus into the Icebound Chasm, where Sneasel ends up being, yet another encounter to add to the team. The only thing I'm worried about here is whether or not I'll be able to teach it a physical ice type move relatively soon, since despite the fact that I'm going to have access to Ice Beam shortly, Sneasel and by extension Weavile's special attack is so bad that it's probably best that I don't even waste the move slot with Ice Beam. Hey Omega, what are the chances of Weavile learning a physical ice move by level up here in Pokemon Glazed? Your direct order while you were playing Brilliant Diamond was to never tell you the odds. Touché. I don't have any ice moves for now though, so I'm gonna use it when I get it from the gym leader until Weavile learns a physical one. Though if I do match that with the Nevermelt ice that I got near the end of Mount Stratus, I should at least be able to do some semblance of good damage. After one stall fest with a Frostlast that must have taken about 10 minutes of real time, I finally arrived in North Coast Town, the home of our fifth gym. At the end of it though, our rival Percy actually wants to fight after getting his badge, but before we get ours, so let's kick his bum. He leans off with Gardevoir, a very easy KO with Weavile's Metal Claw, leading to Quilava. Ah, makes sense why your Pokemon are at full HP after that gym battle, you just spammed this guy. I swap over to Mightyena, then use the Intimidate on that, Zoroark, and Mightyena again, finally getting minus 3, then setting up 6 Mud Slaps as he wastes a healing item, then using 6 Howls in order to KO both this with Poison Fang and Manectric with Bite to finish the battle. Simple enough, probably didn't need to go into that much effort with Mightyena, but better safe than sorry. Speaking of better safe than sorry, Irene's actually got a really tough team with Glaceon, Frostlass, and Weavile, but her lead Pokemon is a snow run and we're going to take advantage of that. I can just set up and take out her whole team with either Mightyena or Umbreon, though the latter is not going to work as well because of what we saw from a Frostlass from a random trainer earlier. So I lead with Umbreon. I figured if he's not going to be useful for Frostlass, 
then it would be probably wise to use first because Frostlass, again, is part ghost type, so she's probably not going to send in a Pokemon that's going to be weak to dark. This is a pretty simple Sand Attack, Curse, Moonlight, and Quick Attack combo to eventually fell this guy, even through Hail making Moonlight only restored her a quarter of Umbreon's HP rather than half. I can play around it to an extent, but only if I'm lucky enough for Snowrunt to use Protect on the turn after Hail ends, which I do manage to line up to maximize my Moonlight points for later in the battle, leading to Weavile who starts going for Protect itself, using nothing but that despite having Brick Break until it's at low HP, though it does finally start using it after a Hyper Potion getting a Critical later, but that's not that big of a deal, that's why we bought Power Point Ups for Moonlight, gives Umbreon an extra bar and a half of HP for situations like this. After two Hyper Potions, I'm eventually able to quick attack this one to death, leading to Glaceon, who despite after having Leftovers and Wish, I can just use a bunch of Sand Attacks and Whale on it, but those end up out healing my quick attacks being enough to not KO, so that's it for Umbreon. I swap into my Deanna, and those six sand attacks make this a swift setup. Six howls and a bite for both Glaceon and Frostlast ends the fight, winning me the Icicle Badge. Again, this is utter comedy that Umbreon is just defying all expectations and being a bulky sweeper while also just bypassing the downside of Curse thanks to Priority Quick Attack. If I had access to Bite or Crunch, I'd definitely use that, but Quick Attack is just so funny to me. After making it out, I'm able to use Surf outside of battle, and despite the fact that I don't want to, Weavile can learn it, so I'm wasting another move slot with a bad special move. After running through the Icicle Tunnel, I'm able to arrive in Cape Azure, leading to the Toonot Safari Zone. Though not in the Safari Zone, there is an encounter that I can grab on the outside in Murkrow. Finally, a flying type and an offensive option against these stupid, stupid fighting types that have been giving me so much hell throughout this run. Despite Sableye being a nice immunity, it just doesn't yield enough damage and just doesn't survive enough hits for it to matter. I've also got access to a Dusk Stone here soon, so this'll be a quick Honchkrow. Before the end of the Safari Zone though, Shell wants another fight, and she's got three Grass types and a Raichu, so pretty good timing that we got Murkrow. Raichu ends up being pretty frustrating though, to the point where I risk getting hit with a critical with Umbreon since I don't have much else to do other than out heal and stall all of the power points for Spark and Shockwave. Sure, Shockwave can hit through Sand Attack due to its effect, but I still think it's worth using Sand Attack because of Raichu's other attack in Tickle, lowering attack and defense, thankfully offsetable with Curse, but the rest of the party can't exactly do that, plus Spark is a physical electric type move taking advantage of that tickle, making Umbreon the best choice here. Not to mention, Synchronize can paralyze her once Umbreon gets paralyzed, which happens pretty early on, making it a much more even playing field. Once I've got enough curses set up though, she's just going for Shockwave, though it only does around a sixth of my HP every time, making it a cinch to outheal with Moonlight especially with all of my curse power points depleted after Tickle lowered my stats a few times. I figured it's time to finally start wailing on it with Quick Attack, but Umbreon runs out of Moonlight power points, making it time to swap into something else. I decide on Sableye, since she's bulky enough, can hit Nightshade, and it's a clear 3 shot that brings her into the red to deplete any healing items that might be on her, but once I'm sure she's out of electric type power points, I swap into Murkrow, KO, then use Wing Attack to run through both Meganium and Parasect, two-shotting the first and one-shotting the second, leaving just Breloom. And while I hate to be this guy and swap out of a flying type on something that's quad weak to it, there's no doubt in my mind that Breloom's running Mach Punch, so I swap into Sableye, and yep, there it is, clear as day. At least this is an easy KO with a few Shadow Claws and Nightshades even through Toxic, after all. She can't do anything to me when her offensive options are Mach Punch and Counter. Anyway, with that annoyance out of the way, I'm given the bike, darting straight down Cycling Road into Southerly City, where I'm reminded that this game also has a third rival. Kato was seen in Flo's gym since he's her son, though I didn't want to go over him since I didn't think he'd come up again. Way to prove me wrong, asshole. Now I'm gonna kick your balls in so far up they come out of your mouth because of it. What, too much? Kato leads off with Houndoom, a pretty good start all things considered, but my team hard walls this guy. So I just go with Zoroark to lower its attack because it has Fire Fang, swapping into Dano, and then taking it down pretty handily with a mix of Dragon Breath and Dragon Claw leading to Feraligator. 
Yeah, there's no way this guy does not have Ice Fang. So I'm swapping into Umbreon and beginning the hilarious sweep that Umbreon is known for at this point. Though I will say getting frozen twice by Ice Fang definitely had me a little stressed out seeing as I didn't have Mighty Enna in the party, but I managed to get out of it fast enough both times. Though once it happened for a third time and Flail started doing minimal damage while I was in the red and Crunch was doing just slightly more, I was worried that this was all for nothing and that Umbreon was gonna have to sit out the rest of this fight, but right before I would have gone to a plan B, he defrosts, allowing me to set up six curses, then KO for Alligator with four quick attacks to lead into Porygon 2. Thank goodness for Moonlight. Thankfully, this computer program's only given permission to execute Conversion 2, meaning Quick Attack is all I have to click, eventually KOing through this Rock and Steel type doofus, leading to Espeon. Hilariously, I still don't have a dark move, but what I don't need is a dark move because Quick Attack 2 shots it, winning me the fight. Umbreon wins again! Long live offensive Umbreon! With that done though, I can move ahead into the Espo clearing, seeing as Ernest isn't in his gym, and I gotta trigger a couple events so that I can fight him as my sixth gym leader. Though, that's a bit frustrating, seeing as that means I have to fight Team Fusion again. Espo Forest also has that Dusk Stone I was talking about, however I can't get deep enough into the area to find it before being whisked away to the Temporal Tower. Team Fusion's next target in order to capture Dialga. Huh. Someone was influenced by Mystery Dungeon. Well, this scarfed Pikachu, you know, that's probably also a Mystery Dungeon reference, is Standing Guard, though not really well since Sableye is able to KO with three Nightshades as he wastes his time with three Agilities. Very smart individual. Thanks to Murkrow and Sableye though, it's a pretty easy progression through here in order to get to the end, facing off against Michael and his wife Regina. Well then, didn't know this was a crime couple business thingy. He's also got a Ditto, as well as his Zoroark, but that's literally it. He's got two Pokemon on his team, so Ditto's an easy KO with Murkrow and two Wing Attacks, leading to Zoroark, so I take it into a Mirror Match. Though not for long, his Flamethrower does over half to my own Zoroark. Whoops. <laughs> but at least he shifts to Sludge Bomb once I swap into Umbreon, eventually being able to activate the Synchronize ability to poison Zoroark once Sludge Bomb does the same to Umbreon. No, it's not quite enough thanks to a full restore, so I swap into Sableye using Rock Smash three times in order to get the KO and the win. Really, why does this guy only have two Pokemon? It feels like this is an oversight. If he's the co-boss, then why am I not going against teams of four or five Pokemon by this point? Anyway, Blake clears out Regina, and hilariously enough, he just becomes the champion mid-story, meaning I've at least got some knowledge of who I'll be facing later on, and I've seen a dark rye out of him, so it's likely going to be a little scary. I'm given the HM for Fly after that, which is perfect for Murkrow, leaving me to go and fight the 6th gym leader, Ernest. Beforehand, though, I made sure to head back into the Espo clearing to search for that Dusk Stone, which happens to be at the end of the area. And it's actually a Dawn Stone. Apparently this was changed between versions and I can't access a Dusk Stone at all until the next region. Which is after the post game, so we're not making it there in this run. Supposedly, I can use Thief and get one off of a Wild Mischievous, but I can't find any accurate logs for any of this garbage, so I might be screwed. Plus, I can't get a hold of Thief anyway, so it doesn't matter. Anyway, salt aside, Ernest. He's a Fire-type user and a bit worrisome, but we're gonna force through offensive Umbreon for the haha -ha funnies. Ernest leads off with Meg Mortar, so I use Mighty Anna and Mud Slap to lower his accuracy, though Substitute ends up being the move of choice after I get through the first one, so I go for Bite to get rid of that, leading to a Fire Blast that nearly one-shots Mighty Anna. So I swap out of here, going for Umbreon on the turn he goes for Fire Blast again, doing less than half, but Sunny Day's gonna boost that by 50% just enough to not KO, so I use another sand attack in the hopes that I can just get rid of the last few power points by him missing, but this fucker keeps hitting the attack despite it being 85% accuracy. Naturally, that's naturally and then a minus three in the accuracy department. This has me tilted beyond belief, so I just use Moonlight despite it being in range to get KO'd by someone spinning in my general direction, thankfully with Thunderbolt missing as I'm able to heal, get back three quarters because of the sunny day being active. I wouldn't have risked that if Sun wasn't up, seeing as Umbreon could still get one shot by Fire Blast at half HP, but here, I'm fine. If I get hit, I'm able to heal the rest of it off. Sure enough, Fire Blast number four lands, but Thunderbolt number two misses. I love it here, I love risking my Umbreon because the stubborn asshole keeps not fucking missing the 85% accurate stab 120 power attack. 
while this non-stamp Thunderbolt 100% accurate move keeps missing. I love it here, you stupid f***ing wanker. I can't wait to kill you with quick attack. <sighs> Umbreon does make it out in one piece, eventually getting enough accuracy deprivation and six curses up to start using quick attack, somehow getting two criticals in a row, forcing a healing item, and the KO with the third, not getting burned by Flame Body, which was also a lucky thing, leading to Infernape. Alright, finally, something different than the Smug Bastard, a Smug Monkey. Infernape also has Fire Blast, so I use a Sand Attack, then Moonlight, then finally, a Fire Blast misses! About damn time! And now everything's missing thanks to Quick Attack. Sadly, the last two Fire Blasts do land, but it's not that bad since I've got them as minus five, and I can just use Moonlight, heal up, and use one last one before seeing Mach Punch connect twice in a row. Well then, lucky bastard, take a critical Quick Attack for your efforts. Third out is Blaziken, and upon seeing Swords Dance Protect and Leftovers, I realize I'm in some deep shit. So I've got to use Sand Attack and use it as much as humanly possible on this guy, since if I let any of those physical attacks touch any of my members of the team, they're dead. Straight up. So I just keep trying to attack with Quick Attack, but these Protects keep working in rapid succession, letting him get back to full HP and eventually land a close combat that nearly KOs Umbreon. But with the amount of accuracy deprivation I've done, I should be able to get two Moonlights strung together for it to matter, and thankfully I do. Using my last Sand Attack and using two Quick Attacks to run through Blaziken into KO, leading to Charizard. Alright, this guy shouldn't be a threat, Charizard's not as hard to take down. Quick Attack does a fourth after Leftovers, and with Charizard using Solar Beam instead of Fire Blast, I'm in a pretty nice position. Missing a Fire Blast as another Quick Attack barely misses the KO, forcing yet another Hyper Potion. I'm just gonna ask, why the heck does this guy have so many Hyper Potions, and why do half of his Pokemon have Leftovers? I have no access to Leftovers, why don't I have any? Alas, Charizard is taken back down to Red HP, though another Hyper Potion comes down. Alright, come on dude, I'm starting to lose it, please just go down already. Another three quick attacks managed to string together enough high rolls to KO without the potential of a third Hyper Potion on Charizard, which leaves exactly Typhlosion. Jeez, talk about starter spam. Thankfully, this guy doesn't have leftovers, so upon seeing Sunny Day, I'm able to hit two quick attacks, taking a solar beam, then grabbing the KO with the third quick attack to win the fight. There was zero chance I won this fight without soloing with Umbreon. This game does not have any dark types that necessarily counter fire very well. With Houndoom being later in the game and things like Sharpedo, Cronon, and Crocodile just being completely absent, sure, I'd say Dragon was a nice typing to have, but Dano doesn't evolve until level 50. I'm not even allowed to have access to Zwilus until after the 8th gym with level caps taken into account. If there was one change I would have made for this fight though, it would have been getting some more power point ups for specifically Sand Attack, so that I had enough of a way to nullify the threats in front of me, more than beyond Blaziken, but I didn't even get to hit 6 of them on Blaziken, so that would have been the one that I wanted them most for. But hey, as I said earlier, LONG LIVE OFFENSIVE UMBREON! Six badges in and I'm coming up on some more Team Fusion baddies. Thankfully, they're not tough to take down anymore thanks to Murkrow and Sableye, though the double battle at the beginning with Mag Border and Electivire threw me for a little bit of a loop. Did not expect to do the post-game battle against Flint and Volkner on a smaller scale from just two measly grunts, but here I am, I suppose. I'm able to head into their current base of operations over in the Spatial Ruins, which Sounds like they want Palkia, and boy howdy, I don't know why this Pikachu wants to fight me so much. I destroy him yet again, and hopefully by what he says afterwards, that means I won't have to see him ever again. We're too late though, the power of space-time is in Team Fusion's grasp, though I don't ask how they got those Master Balls, that's never explained. Well, chalk that up under the fail column, though with them being done with their thing, it's time for my 7th gym battle, so who am I to care? Nicole is a rock type user with a pretty strong team, and once again, due to not having access to water and grass types like Sharpedo, Crawdon, Shiftery, or Cagturn, I'm in a pretty rough spot. Though I think I've got a rough idea on how I should take her down, and that's by going and grabbing Scraggy from the Espo clearing. A fighting type should at least be something good against rock types, despite their normally massive defense stat. And since the level cap is high enough, I'm able to evolve her into Scrafty before the fight as well. She leads with Tyranitar, a perfect target for this Brick Break to one-shot. Good start with Rhyperior coming out second, whom I can nail with Brick Break for half, though Substitute puts a damper on the two-shot idea, though no Hyper Potion or Full Restore is good to see. 
Earthquake puts a damper on using Scrafty for the rest of this fight, KOing with a third Brick Break as Cradility comes out third. Now this shouldn't be too threatening in the face of Umbreon, so I can throw that out, take a quarter from Giga Drain, then take a Toxic and use Synchronize to reflect that back at him. The only problem here is that Sandstorm is not going away. Sandstream is one of those abilities that just sets up weather and doesn't go away until Generation 6 and beyond, where that gets fixed to be the normal Sandstorm runtime of 5 turns, or 8 if you have the appropriate held item. Unfortunately, that means Moonlight is practically useless here because it only heals a fourth of my HP rather than half. So after using a few sand attacks, I swap into Zoroark for Intimidate, then into Sableye, though Cradily just starts spamming Recover here. But that is something I can actually take advantage of with Nightshade. Since he'll eventually get to the point of not using Recover while near full HP, I'm able to just string together two Nightshades, with Poison helping me reach that KO range, leaving just two members remaining. The first of them is Shuckle, which is actually perfect for Sableye as Nightshade bypasses those high defenses and two shots leaving just Agron. Yeah, this guy is uh, rougher than the rest of them, the best of them, tougher than leather. You can call him Knuckles if you prefer. Jokes aside, I'm scared as all hell of this thing, so it's time for some Intimidate spamming. I swap into Mightyena on the Toxic, then into Zorwark as a second Intimidate makes Iron Head do less than half, and since I'm expecting another Toxic, I swap back into Mightyena for the third Intimidate, then use a Mud Slap, which is actually quite effective here in the hopes that I can lower the accuracy enough to where this shouldn't do too much even if it lands an attack, though that Toxic Poison is really gumming up my idea of using two of them. Probably should have just swapped back into Zoroark and then Mighty Enna to get it to minus 5. So I swap back into Sableye, taking Iron Head for 20 damage, and with Sandstorm it's barely less than half of what I have remaining, so I stay in and use Water Pulse in the hope of confusion, but no dice. Running out of options here, so I swap back into Zoroark for Intimidate to get it to minus 4, taking an Ice Punch and Sandstorm damage for less than half of my remaining HP. So I use Shadow Ball here for some decent damage, but man, those leftovers are stacking up. They're really gumming up everything here. I risk it for the Biscuit, staying in and using a second Shadow Ball, but Zoroark's too far gone now. I just gotta let this guy go and keep doing damage to grab the Revenge KO with someone else. So I hit another Shadow Ball, this time lowering her special defense, which might help. But Iron Head misses again. <laughs> well, shoot, for minus one accuracy, that's really lucky. And that's just enough for another Shadow Ball to KO thanks to that special defense drop, winning me the fight without a single loss. And here I thought the last fight was a miracle, Zoroark pulling out all the dodges in the world to keep himself alive, and I very much appreciate it. One more badge in the lead to go with no deaths, knock on wood, I can make it through with a perfect run. Since we're coming up on the end of the game, I figured it was time for some TM hunting, going down the list of stuff that I potentially missed in order to further optimize my team, and that's when I realized the move relearner was actually in Sea Spray Town the entire time. And here I thought... He was only in Johto, but here one was in the Toonod region, allowing me to put stuff like Ice Punch on Weavile, and realize that Baton Pass is available on Umbreon in order to pass Curse up to any of my other physical attackers. The Name Raider is also here, so I take the time to rename Umbreon, since it didn't give me the option to name it when I got it from the Lighthouse Challenge, leaving just the TM search. This also led me into the Fusion Resort back on Serenity Isle, in which I'm told they have two people on the fourth floor that can teach any Pokemon, any Pokemon either Leaf Blade or Spore. Yeah, you know, the high critical chance grass move that would have been really helpful against Nicole, or the 100% accurate sleep inducing move to help lead into more sweeps with Umbreon and company. Yeah, I feel really dumb having done the risks I pulled earlier in the run, but hey, we live and we learn. If I come back around to this game, I'll know it's here from the get-go. I'm also able to take a ferry from Stormy City onto the Trainer Isle, where every single type boosting item has been held this entire time as well, going from about, well, zero competitive held items to anything I could have ever imagined. Seriously wish I had done a bit more searching into the walkthroughs of this game, but boy is it hard to look up resources for a game that has an alternate version under the name Blazed Glazed, as well as multiple versions of itself that get changed. Alas, it's time for one more final showdown with Team Fusion, fitting as the end of the main story is occurring between the 7th and 8th gyms. For the sake of brevity though, none of this really matters until Michael shows us that he's using Dialga, Palkia, and Garatina to summon Mew, all a part of a business venture to create the ultimate TM, one that can teach any Pokemon any move. 
Now that sounds incredibly broken and would throw the metagame into disarray. We cannot have that. Also, I guess all of the other potential terrorist activities people could do with their Bulbasaurs or some shit like that. Michael, of course, is using all three of them in battle, so let's try to tear these gods a new one. First up is Dialga, who's taking massive damage from Scrafty's Brick Break after firing off Flash Cannon for a good chunk of damage, and since I'm guaranteeing this guy has Thror of Time, I'm swapping into Umbreon, tanking a critical just well enough so that Moonlight on the resting turn means a second won't KO, leaving Umbreon with 5 HP. I'm kind of just healing to stall out Roar of Time power points, uh, while also setting up a few sand attacks in the hopes that I can just throw Scrafty back out there, and so far that seems to be working. I've got enough Moonlights in the tank to where I can set up a few curses with Umbreon, not even needing to swap back into Scrafty, using Sand Attack a few more times, using my Masked Moonlight, and beginning to use Bite. Bite takes out Dialga as Palkia comes out second and goes 2 for 1 on this, missing with the first Spatial Rend, but hitting the second as two Bites make sure to get the KO, leaving just Garatina, who really has zero offensive pressure here, using Slash for minimal damage as two Bites KOs Garatina, even through a Hyper Potion, finally putting an end to Team Fusion, though we're one step away from that ending. With those massive Mons out of the way, he's still got enough juice left in the tank to summon Mew, and it is pissed, having a massive boost to its HP and other stats while also glowing a nice little red. But that's where Sableye comes in. Thanks to having an immunity to Psychic, not to mention being relatively bulky and having access to Spore, Confuse Ray, and Nightshade, I can spam these and hold Mew down while Ancient Power barely does anything, KOing in a few shots and leaving Team Fusion to disband. Well then, that was easy. On to the 8th gym. This happens to reside in Darkwood Town, but before I can get into that gym, we've got another fight with Percy on our hands. He still has that pesky Gardevoir, so I went back to Sea Spray Town to reteach Metal Claw to Weavile, putting me in a prime position to take him down quickly. Of course, Metal Claw manages to get the outspeed and KO, leading to Quilava out second, even though it should be a Typhlosion by now. So I swap into Zorwark for Intimidate, then into Sableye, putting him to sleep with Spore and using Water Pulse twice. Once getting a critical, and the other confusing him to get him into the red, leading to a Max Potion, but notably not a full restore, meaning that confusion's still on. But really nothing worrying about that, as a few more attacks allow for Quilava to fall, while Sableye doesn't take a single point of damage, leading to McNectric. I put him to sleep with Spore, taking a Thunderbolt beforehand for a little under half, and that's not too bad. I'm able to take this perfect opportunity, swap into Scrafty for a late game sweep, hitting Brick Break despite Maynectra waking up beforehand, hitting two Thunderbolts before going down, and leading to a Scraggy of his own, falling immediately to Brick Break, since it also is part dark type as well as fighting, as Seedra comes in last. Now hilariously enough, just I guess this is my luck, Percy puts a clock on himself by using Scald while I swap into Umbreon, burning Umbreon while Synchronized does its thing, and since Seedra's the last mon on his team, he's kinda boned here. I'm just able to just sit and drain his HP with the burn as Sand Attack helps prevent damage and Moonlight heals off whatever does manage to make it through, finally leading to the KO once and for all with Bite. You could say I sealed that fight with a single Bite. Alright, I'm sorry, rhymes are cringe. Anyway, our last gym leader happens to be Tyson and his fighting types. Hmm, I wonder who that could be a reference to. In case you didn't notice though, I evolved my Murkrow into Hunchcrow. That's because on my way through to Darkwood Town, I managed to find a Duskstone. <laughs> Which means this should be a piece of cake one way or another. I actually start with Sableye against him as he goes with Hitmonlee, going for Earthquake as I go with Spore to put it to sleep, and I'm guessing he's holding a Choice Band? Since once he wakes up, he's not going for any fighting type moves after I swap into Umbreon and start setting up Curse, hitting three of them off before he wakes up and starts hitting Light Earthquakes. The point of this though is to simply get six Curses up while using minimal Moonlights, eventually doing so once Hitmonlee is stuck using Struggle and doing absolutely pitiful damage. Return is my new move of choice over Bite, and manages to get the one shot here leading to Gallade, who falls to the same after using Sword Stance. Two down, three to go as Lucario's in third, and sadly it's resistant to anything I could have learned physically, with it taking two returns and hanging on in the red because of some damn leftovers. These items are really the bane of my existence. Thankfully, Brick Break can't do more than half with two of them, so while he heals, I do with Moonlight. Though, once I see Swords Dance, I'm a little bit more cautious. 
Two more returns ends up getting two high enough rolls to where they KO, leading to Conkledur fourth with Hammer Arm doing massive damage despite being plus six in defense. I figure my only way of surviving this onslaught is to make sure I'm at full HP and use Sand Attack until he starts missing frequently, then start attacking with Return, and that ends up being the play. I'm sure that if he hit a critical at any point during this that Umbreon would have just insta died, but as I say in my runs, it's never criticals that do me in, it's always those stupid damage ranges. F*** that Lucario by the way. Either way, I burn through my last Moonlight, but do eventually KO with two returns, burning through all of Conkledur's hammer arms and taking a light mock punch before Scrafty comes in last. Brick Break doesn't do much at all, so I just use return, bring him into the red, and heal locking him though he will have another chance to attack once this chain of max potions is over, though the fact that he used three of them on the same Mon, and that being the last Mon, wasn't the smartest decision. Not that the AI has a say in that, but you know, I'm just gonna blame it on him because he dumb dumb. With that done though, I've got the last gym badge in hand, and I'm ready for the league. Victory Road in this game isn't quite victory road, rather it's an extended trip throughout multiple areas with badge gates spread out rather far, though the last few rival fights end up being on this road, so let's talk about them. Shell is here for one last challenge, this time leading Raichu against my Weavile, easily outed by Ice Punch once Fake Out gets that cheeky flinch in. Uh, ne never mind, that one just barely didn't KO. Alas, Spark doesn't do enough to one shot Weavile, let alone two shot, so I stay in to KO with Faint Attack through the paralysis leading to Parasect. This should be a pretty nice point in which to swap into Sableye, putting Parasect to sleep with Spore, since for some reason you can put Grass types to sleep with Spore, then swap into Haunch Grow to KO with Drill Pack. Third out is Meganium, and he's an easy one to take care of thanks to Swift barely doing anything and Drill Pack one-shotting, leading to Breloom who's outsped by Haunch Crow and taken down handily, leaving just Gabite. I stay in and take the Dragon Claw with Drill Pack firing back and grabbing the one-shot KO in the win. <laughs> Shoot, that's one rival down, but that's not quite it. One of the areas on this stretch ends up housing Houndoom as my final encounter, but the area also has Absol, a Pokemon I could have grabbed much earlier from the North Coast area and the Ski Challenge that I never ventured on. So I make sure to go back, grab that, as well as moving to grab Skaroopy over in the Gemini River area. I do want to use Drapion on my final team for the league, so he's going to be rather important coming up soon. Lastly, I made sure to capture that Houndoom with my Master Ball, so now that we got the whole squad available, I make it through the victory road itself, leaving just the Elite Four and the Champion. Is what I would say if Kato wasn't exactly a tile before entering the gates of the Elite. He leads off with a Houndoom of his own as I go with Scrafty, using Brick Break, but not before he gets off a Will-O-Wisp that doesn't allow for the one-shot, healing with a full restore afterwards. I probably should have risked the high jump kick there, just so I wouldn't take an attack next turn, but I'm dumb and that's fine. I KO with the second Brick Break as Feraligator comes in second, allowing for my bulky Drapion to come in, set up two sword stances in the face of three slashes for less than half damage, then he just starts kicking teeth in, KOing Feraligator with Poison Jab, Gabite with Earthquake, Porygon Z with Poison Jab, and Espeon with Crunch to win the battle. Well, that was exactly what I was hoping for out of Drapion. Gotta get in some of that last minute glory since he was a last minute addition. With that though, it's training up to the cap of level 53 time, edging just enough as to not over level, and I'm ready for the league. No losses yet, let's see if we can pull off the perfect run. So I hate to be the bearer of boring news, but this league has been made exponentially easier by exactly one move that I got at the move relearner, and that being Scrafty's Dragon Dance. By using this five times against Rosaline, I'm able to sweep her Licky Licky with Brick Break, Chansey with Brick Break, Milotic with Leaf Blade, Slowking also with Leaf Blade, leaving just Blissey, who falls to Brick Break. Whoever's idea it was to give Leaf Blade to every single Pokemon in the game was both genius and hilariously stupid at the same time. Giving that move to Scrafty single-handedly made that battle soloable because of Milotic. Sure, I would have had Crunch for Slowking. However, it's not as easy coming up. But then again, I'm pretty sure that doesn't mean anything. Magnus is the purple Elite Four user, rather than being based on typings. This league is based on colors, which is pretty cool for a league concept. Keeps a certain theme while allowing for teams to be more diverse than initially thought of. 
However, this ends up being a pretty cut and dry case of sweepitis. By simply using a mix of Sand Attack, Curse, and Moonlight with Umbreon, I'm able to baton pass over the plus six attack and defensive curse over to Scrafty, using Dragon Dance a total of 11 times to get out of the negative speed rut and gain enough to where this entire team won't be able to outspeed Scrafty, and even if they did survive a plus six attack, they wouldn't be able to do anything about it because of plus six defense, and it's all thanks to Shed Skin. With Glare being such a problem on Arbok, I figured Scrafty is the best choice for sweeping since I don't have to deal with the paralysis sticking around for long, eventually KOing Arbok with Crunch, Mian Xiao with Brick Break, Gengar with Crunch, Sableye also with Crunch, leaving just Drapion to fall to a Brick Break for the easy win. Speaking of which, uh, is it Drapion? Is it Drapion? How do you pronounce it? Leave a comment below. You know, Drape or Drap? I don't know how you do that phonetically, I guess drape would end with an E. I don't know why I'm telling you to comment about pronunciations when that's in text form, but you know, that's just my mind running and being dumb. Anyway, the next member, Tanya, she's gotta put up more of a fight, right? Well, she does, but only with her lead Floatzel. She has access to Bulk Up, while also having Waterfall as a really powerful physical water type move. Though by just matching her Bulk Ups with Curse, thanks to Umbreon, I'm able to outpace the damage, while also using Sand Attack to ensure that attacks don't land in the first place, eventually being able to use the same strategy that I pulled with Magnus, getting to plus 6 with Curse, minus 6 with Sand Attack, Moonlighting to keep Umbreon healthy in case I have to come back into it later in the fight, and of course draining the power points of Waterfall before Baton passing over into Scrafty, and using a boatload of Dragon Dances in order to nullify Curse's negative effect. At this point, Floatzel only has Ice Punch and Crunch left as moves to do anything, making this a simple setup, eventually KOing the team with Leaf Blade on Floatzel, Brick Break on Arcanine, Brick Break on Infernape, Crunch on Shedinja, and Crunch on Dragonite to win. Yeah, we even had an out to Wonder Guard. Gotta love it. Alright, one more member of the league after some power point healing with the very limited items given throughout the game, there really wasn't even any berries, it's time for the final league member in Grey. He used to be the champion before Blake, but he's about to get pumpstered and dumpstered again. Despite Zoroark being a special user on his team with Sludge Bomb and Flamethrower, I'm easily able to combat it with Umbreon's natural special bulk, alternating Sand Attack, Curse, and Moonlight to eventually get to plus 6 attack and defense on Umbreon, and minus 6 accuracy on Zoroark. Now you may be wondering why I'm even bothering to use Curse while against a special attacker when I'm just going to sweep, and that's because later on in this fight he has Agron, and Agron has Sturdy, and it works like the Gen 5 and Onward version of it. So, of course, I do want that defense because it also has Brick Break, and I'm not going to let Scrafty die this far in. With that all said and done though, I'm able to eventually baton pass and then get 10 dragon dances in, or so, I didn't count, KOing Zoroark with Brick Break, Agron with Brick Break after Sturdy ends up triggering, then using Brick Break and Leaf Blade, Skarmory with Brick Break, thankfully no Sturdy here, Machamp with Brick Break, and Mighty Enna with, you guessed it, Brick Break. Blake is the last member left, the champion, and after seeing him have Darkrai, I think Scrafty's got a knuckle sandwich with his name on it. Sadly, this fight doesn't go as perfectly as I would hope, though. Snorlax ends up being his lead as I go curse for curse with him with Umbreon, though Body Slam does end up getting the paralysis pretty quickly before I start using more curses, eventually setting up six of them and using Sand Attack to lower his accuracy, but only three times before a critical Body Slam ruins my day, KOing Umbreon and leaving that perfect run just inches away. Alas, despite Curse being a pretty crazy move and having Snorlax in perfect sweeping position, I can bring in Honchkrow after accidentally bringing in Houndoom, sacrificing it to hit as many Feather Dances as possible, in this case getting to 5 of them, making Snorlax go down to minus 4 attack, leaving me to go into Scrafty and set up 6 Dragon Dances, only to sweep from here. 3 Brick Breaks does in Snorlax due to it being plus 6 defense from its own Curse, Brick Break on Weavile, Brick Break on Honchkrow, Brick Break on Umbreon, boy this team is looking really familiar, Brick Break on Houndoom, oh my god I'm literally using the same team, and Brick Break on the Dastardly Darkrai winning me the match. Well then, that was a little disappointing at the end, but I'll take it. Only two losses out of the entire run, and my name gets to go into the Hall of Fame. Hold up, where are the credits? Am I not given the credits, since there's still technically two regions in this game? 
Well, that's a little disheartening. I don't have enough time to continue this run if I'm going to, you know, stick with the whole one video a week thing and be able to you know, do that for more than two weeks before accidentally skipping a week. But when I come back around to Glazed, maybe with Blazed Glazed, I'll make sure to tackle the Johto region alongside the Toonot region. Until next time, though, I hope you enjoyed the challenge, and take care.